Well, good evening and welcome to our service here at St. Mary's this evening. Uh, my name is Thomas Walton. I'm a member of this congregation. It's lovely to see so many of us here tonight. And if you're visiting us today or you've recently joined us, then we hope you feel especially welcome. And please do stay around and meet more of us after the service. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we meet together tonight because of Jesus and because of the hope he gives us. Let's pray as we start our time together this evening. Our Father, thank you that we can meet here tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that we will be ready to listen to his words tonight. Please prepare our hearts now. Please both encourage us and challenge us as we meet this evening. And please give us a greater love for Jesus. For we ask this in his name. Amen. And we're going to start our service by singing a hymn which points us straight to Jesus. He is our Redeemer. He has triumphed over sin and death. And he is now with us forever. Let's sing about him now. Please do stand as we sing together.
great truths. Let's take a seat. As we just sung, Jesus has redeemed us by his blood. Everyone who trusts in Jesus has been completely forgiven by him once for all, for all past, present, and future sins through his death on the cross. But we all keep repeatedly sinning against him. We keep forgetting his promise that he is with us forevermore. And we often put ourselves, rather than Jesus, at the center of our lives. So as we remember our forgiveness in Jesus, let's confess our sins to God again now in the words of the prayer of confession, which is coming up on the screens. We pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. May Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Richard is going to come and bring us some church family notices. Well, good evening. Lovely to, to be here with you all. Uh, thank you for your introduction, Thomas. And let me add my welcome. My name is Richard. Um, I'm a member of the staff team here responsible for this evening service. Um, if we haven't met, uh, it will be lovely to meet you afterwards. We're going to have uh, coffee and cold drinks after the service at the back. Oh, and especially a uh, warm welcome if you're visiting. I've already met people from Bristol, from Essex, from Carlisle, I think. I'm sure there are, there are many others visiting, so welcome to you. And it's also lovely to see a number of folks who I know have had a really hard week. Uh, so it's good to see you. Um, we're going to just have a moment um, for, the, for the regular members of the church now to um, go through a couple of dates for your calendars. Um, so just a reminder that on the 12th of September, um, the week of the 12th, that's when our growth group starts. So if you're in a midweek growth group, uh, do pop that into your calendar. Um, 15th of October, uh, an amazing evening of advice and help on parenting, um, hosted by Edge Drew with cheese and wine, apparently, so e even more worthwhile coming to. Um, 18th of October, uh, uh, a wonderful guest evening with Tim Farron, who is a, um, he, he used to be the, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, he's a, a famous politician, and um, it'll be a lovely event to invite friends and family to. And then a heads up to the 20th of November, because these things get booked up uh, very quickly. This is our, our 6.30 Women's Weekend Away down in Sussex. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, do let us know. Um, and I think Nick is now going to give us a, a notice about the Holiday Club. So th we've been praying for this for, for months now. This is our, um, our little camp that we do here in church, I guess, for... Um, for children of primary school age. And there's a few uh, prayers and last minute things that Nick wants to speak us about, to, to us about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Yeah, as I'm sure you're all aware, Holiday Club is starting this Wednesday and we've got 90 children booked in. Over 30 of those don't go to church. So please do pray, be praying for those kids who don't know Jesus and who will be possibly hearing about Jesus for the first time this week. So do be praying for them. Pray for us too. All the volunteers are going to be meeting on Tuesday at 9.30 in the morning to kind of get everything ready and coordinate everything. So be praying for us as we do that. And then from Wednesday to Friday each morning, we're going to be doing teaching, games, craft, all that kind of stuff to be uh, teaching the kids more about Jesus. One request is we do still need someone to do slides, do projection at the back of the church in the meeting. So if you are able to press a button on a computer, please do come and let either me or Kate know. 
um, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Great, thank you both. We're going to sing again now. We're going to sing about God's perfect wisdom. So please do stand and we'll sing together. take a seat and please pick up your Bibles as we're going to hear God's word read to us now and then Neil Watkinson is going to come to preach to us. If you don't have a Bible please either go to get one from the welcome area or wave and one of the welcome team I'm sure can bring one to you. The first reading tonight is from Deuteronomy 15 verses 7 to 11 and that's found on page 194 of the church Bibles. So that's Deuteronomy, chapter 15, starting at verse 7 on page 194. If there is a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbour this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for cancelling debts, is near so that you do not show ill will toward your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and towards the poor and needy in your land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. The second reading is from Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 14, and can be found on page 1050 of the Church Bibles. Oh, 
So page 1050, Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 14. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and a man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in his fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received, good, you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone come over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Great. Thank you for those um, very clear and helpful readings. Let's pray, and uh, I'd encourage you, if you have a Bible, uh, to keep that open in front of you and compare what I say with what's written there. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, that you're a speaking God. Thank you that uh, you want us to know you and to understand uh, what you say. And so we pray for your Holy Spirit to give us understanding and to shape and soften our hearts and to open our ears. For we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If I get the opportunity, I'd like to write a book with the title, God Wants You Rich and Other Lives We've Heard. Now, apart from there being 10 titles that you can get on Amazon with the first part of that title of my prospective book, God Wants You Rich. Uh, there's another reason why I'd want to write the book. A few years ago, um, I was training in uh, Yangon in Myanmar, where it's not a safe place to go to at the moment. And there was a young man came and he, he came along to the provincial headquarters of the Church of the Province of Myanmar. So they're HQ, really. And he said that he was praying for a breakthrough in his finances. And the phrase to me sounded alarmingly similar to that of a well-known prosperity preacher in Singapore, which is where I was based at the time. And so we talked some more. I was very keen to talk some more. And it's very hard for somebody in that situation uh, where many people live on a dollar a day, one US dollar a day or less, to say something about the danger of pursuing wealth. But the problem troubled the early church. We can read about it in 1 Timothy. Uh, we hear Jesus in uh, Luke chapter 16 challenging the Pharisees about it. 
And the point is, money and possessions, they're so tangible, aren't they? They seem to offer us far greater security than a God that we can't see. And they certainly can help us in some ways. But the thing is, money is not God. And therefore, money must not be loved and it mustn't be trusted in the way that God alone is to be loved and trusted. Now, Jesus has been warning the Pharisees from at least as far back as the beginning of chapter 15. There they'd been grumbling because of the kind of people that he'd been hanging out with. And Jesus wants them to see that they just don't share his priorities. And we've heard three parables about lostness, people who seemed so far away, and yet God rejoices when they're brought back to him, when they're found. And then Jesus teaches it, uh, follows it up by teaching about using wealth wisely in this world. That's what we heard about last week in the first part of chapter 16. Jesus' followers are to use whatever resources God has given them in order to serve him and to serve others well. And the point is, we're to do that because it is impossible to serve God and money. And that's where Jesus concluded, where we'd reached um, at the end of last week, verse 13 of chapter 16, you cannot serve both God and money. But that then really winds up the Pharisees. They respond with sneers because they do love money. And that's when we hear Jesus warning about fake religion's real danger. That's the first thing. Fake religion's real danger in verses 14 to 18. Let me read again from, from there. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. Now, we mustn't forget how highly regarded the Pharisees were by the man or woman in the street. You know, they seemed to have it all together in terms of their faith. Everyone looked up to them. But Jesus just sees right through them, and he keeps on exposing their play-acting at religion. You see, God's values and theirs are at loggerheads. And fake religion's real danger is this, that loving money is spiritual adultery. So Jesus continues uh, in verse 16. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom is being preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. John the Baptist had arrived on the scene, and he's preparing the way, he's paving the way for Jesus' own ministry. John's message, it was completely in line with the Old Testament, the, the teaching of the law and the prophets, that means the whole of the Old Testament together. And that teaching would include the command to love God and worship him above everything else in their lives. And so that would mean the need for repentance. That just means an about turn, doing what the Aussies called a, a yui. You turn around and you stop going your own way and you start going God's way. Now, with Jesus teaching about God's kingdom, there was still the need to repent, to do that about turn, and to believe this message. And that is probably the, the uh, helps us to understand the end of verse 16. It's translated as everyone is forcing his way into it. And probably it, it, it means that everyone is being urged forcefully to enter God's kingdom. Through John's preaching and through what Jesus is saying, it's becoming really, really clear. This is so important. Stop what you're doing. Listen and respond. Enter God's kingdom now. Whatever it costs you, 
That is what Jesus has been preaching. That's what he's urging. But God's law, verse 17, is still important. Not just the Ten Commandments, but everything so far in the Old Testament, in the first five books. Now, it's not that keeping God's commandments is going to get you into heaven, as if you can ever do that. No. But God's desire is still that we live in the way that he's taught us, in the way that he's spoken about in the Old Testament. He still determines what is right and what's wrong. And so the commandment to love God above everything else, including money, still applies. And that's not easy, is it? You know, we've got game shows like The Wall and The Wheel, and if that's not your thing, The Antiques Roadshow, because, you know, you're thinking, well, how much is that worth that I got for a fiver at a car boot sale? That's the way we tick, isn't it? Wanting to get more, knowing how much things cost. Our culture obsesses over the rich and the successful. And sadly, religious institutions and individuals who consider themselves devout can still be exactly the same. You know, witness the wealth of some denominations around the world and the way that lavish church buildings can still be constructed in the midst of crushing poverty. Or the way that um, they parade pomp in lavish vestments. Or the teaching of prosperity teachers, like I said at the beginning. Jesus then points to one way in which the Pharisees had abandoned God's law concerned divorce and remarriage. Now, there isn't time for us to be able to look at, even to start to scratch the surface. Um, and it will be, no doubt, a painful and difficult issue for some of us because of what's happened or what's going on in our lives. If we were to think about all of this, we'd need to think about, first of all, Genesis chapter 2 and God's good purpose for marriage to be lifelong between a man and a woman. We'd also look at Deuteronomy chapter 24 and what God does in terms of allowing permission for there to be divorce. And then we'd read on a little bit further and we would find out what Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 19 where he says that concession that was given in Deuteronomy 24, it's given because of your sinfulness, what he calls your hardness of heart. And yet God's command and his intention for marriage still stands. And it's worrying if, if Christians either deliberately or inadvertently just adopt the same way of thinking about marriage and divorce as their non-Christian family and friends. That's worrying, isn't it? Because God's word is to teach us and to shape our thinking on even such a, a personal and emotive topic. But without ignoring what Jesus says in verse 18 and the challenge of it as he literally teaches it, I wonder if there's something else also going on. You see, the theme of the whole of this chapter is money. That's what we heard last week in verses 1 to 13. And it's what the next story that Jesus is going to teach is all about. So is Jesus also accusing the Pharisees of spiritual adultery in verse 18, of effectively divorcing God and marrying money instead, if you could put it that way? That would be a damning indictment and criticism of the Pharisees' religion, wouldn't it? Whatever they make, somehow they've divorced God and they're in love with money instead. You see, whenever we pick and choose what we will um, believe and live by in the Bible, well, we're headed into fake religion, aren't we? just like the Pharisees who love money and they've ignored what God has said before. They lived for here and now, they're cherishing wealth, and they keep God at a distance, even as he speaks to them face to face in Jesus, and you cannot get closer to God than that. And they still don't want to listen. 
And to emphasize what a disaster it is to have loved money and not God, Jesus plows straight on with this really sobering story, which teaches us fake religion's terrible reward. That's the second thing we we hear about, fake religion's terrible reward. Uh, Let me begin the, the story in verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the rich man carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. So here is a, a, a very wealthy man. He has it all. So dressing in purple and fine linen, it's the equivalent of having all of your wardrobe from Armani and all of your underwear from Calvin Klein or wherever you want to sort of raise the bar to. You can have all of it in silk. You know, he does not worry about his budget at all. He's a success in life, just like the Pharisees, in love with money and his lavish lifestyle. And our first reading from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 to 11, is just one of the many times that God has spelled out really, really clearly in the Old Testament that his people were to be responsible for those in need who were living around them. But this man's just ignored that. Because not far from his front door is a homeless guy called Lazarus. His name means God helps. And he is desperate to salvage whatever he can from the rich man's black food waste bin that would be left out each week. That's his condition. And he's in such a state, he has sores all over his body and the local stray dogs lick them clean. It's not surprising, is it, that he dies in such poor health and poverty. But then he's given a fine funeral funeral, in as much as angels are his pallbearers at the funeral, taking him to heaven. And Mr. Richmond, whose name we never get to hear, then also dies. But he goes to the other place. Verse 23... In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go over from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So being with Abraham, so the great ancestor of the Jews, is to be with God in paradise. That's the language that Jesus is using. And maybe for the first time, Mr. Richman takes real notice of Lazarus. He's been there at his door all those weeks, months, years. And now he asks Father Abraham to run an errand, to get Lazarus to run an errand and bring him water in the sweltering heat. You know what it's been like over the last few weeks? And you think, I just want a glass of cold water or anything cold. That is what the man wants. But Abraham now explains that everything is reversed. He'd enjoyed living for himself because YOLO was his motto. You only live once during his life on earth. Well, now he's getting his just desserts. Meanwhile, Lazarus, the one who trusted God during such, his, such a hard existence, is getting his reward, being with God and finally enjoying God's comfort perfectly. 
Now, Jesus is using picture language in the story, but he affirms that there is existence beyond the grave and that hell is real, that death will seal the decision that you've made in this life. And so there's no second chance after death. You hear that in the story? And there is no way to get from hell to heaven. There is no purgatory. And we might find this all really unpalatable and think, you know, how dare you? But it's, we've got to remember who's telling us this story. It is Jesus, the most compassionate, loving man who has ever lived. And he does that. He teaches us about the reality of punishment after death so that we will act on his warning. It's infinitely more important than a government health warning with a graphic picture on a packet of cigarettes. Tragically, this man has sealed his own fate because he'd ignored what God had already told him many times in the Old Testament. For example, Deuteronomy 15. He'd had no regard for desperate Lazarus. And even the dogs had had more compassion on Lazarus, licking his sores clean. Now, I think the most disturb disturbing example of this kind of coexistence of rich and poor that I've ever experienced was when I was living in India and working there. In the cities of Delhi and Mumbai, the people living on the pavements with their shacks constructed out of bits of timber and fabric or sacks leaning against the walls of luxury apartment blocks or on the perimeter walls of the compound. Maybe you've seen that. Maybe you've seen something very similar. The challenge for most of us who live in the West, in the prosperous West, is that we are rich by comparison with most of the rest of the world even though we are facing huge increases in the cost of living. So I continue to be challenged by, for example, passages like this in God's word and the needs of the poor who will be living not that far from us here in Maidenhead. But also, having just returned from doing teaching in East Asia, I continue to be challenged by the needs around the world. I really want to make sure that as a family we seek to be generous with what God has given us and that I see that the resources that we have are, are not simply for our own benefit but they're to be used for God's glory and to meet the needs of others. However, remember who Jesus was warning here. It was religious people who loved money and who disliked his teaching. No matter how upright and decent these people seemed to be. And his main target was self-confident, hypocritical religious people who turned a deaf ear to God. You see, the point of the story isn't that the main, this man's main problem was that he was rich. Jesus was not condemning wealth in and of itself, but it was the man's use of wealth which revealed where his heart lay. And Jesus is certainly not teaching us that if you're kind to the poor, regardless of what you believe, then, you know, when you die, you're going to be all right. That would flatly contradict everything else that he taught and that's written in the Bible. The reality is that you can be poor and selfish as well, and you can be lacking money and yet love it as well. As Jesus has said in verse 15, God knows your hearts. It's what goes on inside that really matters to God, however much or little we may think we've got. And it's, at the end of the day, it's his evaluation of our life that matters nobody else's. And that's what becomes really clear in the final part of the sto story. 
And that's where we see fake religion's deep problem. Fake religion's deep problem. You see, this man has chosen to serve money, not God, and he embodies all that Jesus has warned against in verse 13. Let me read the final part of the story from verse 27. The man answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, Mr. Richmond realizes too late, um, it's too late for himself, but maybe it's not too late for his nearest and dearest. Could Abraham perhaps send Lazarus to warn them so that they don't end up in hell too? Well, maybe it could be in a, a kind of vivid dream or a dramatic vision. Maybe somehow Lazarus could come back from the dead and warn them, and then, you know, then they're going to really listen. But Abraham says they already have the whole of the Old Testament to warn them. That's exactly what Jesus had been saying in verses 16 and 17 about the Old Testament. His five brothers should be listening to what God has already said. No, you don't see, Father Abraham. You know, if Lazarus goes, if he comes back from the dead, then they will listen. But now we hear the fundamental problem that Mr. Richmond has had and all his family as well. It's very sobering, isn't it? Verse 31. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So, you, so we see that fake religion's deep problem is that it's an ongoing refusal to listen to God's word, to what God has already said to us, to what God is saying to us today in the words of the Bible. And even someone coming back from the dead won't convince you if you're that obstinate about refusing to listen to God. We may think that, you know, really powerful miracles, whatever you can think of, would convince a person to change their mind about Jesus and its message. And Jesus says no. He warns them otherwise. He warns us to think otherwise. Because the point is, if people refuse to take God's word seriously, which he's given to us in our own language now, they're not even a very powerful, dramatic sign like someone rising from the dead is going to change your mind and your heart. And the point is that Jesus is, is not just speaking about this character Lazarus in the story. He's giving the Pharisees advanced warning about his own resurrection from the dead. Jesus will rise from the dead it happened. There's lots of good evidence for it. But if people haven't listened to God's word through the Old Testament law and the prophets, and if they won't listen to Jesus when he's speaking to them in person, well, when he comes back from the dead, then that's not going to change their minds either. In verses 14 to 18, Jesus has underlined the importance of God's word, that the Old Testament teaches us what God desires for us, how he wants us to live. And it doesn't mean that God's standards have dropped, even though it's been fulfilled in Jesus. God wants us to love him, not money. You cannot serve both. It's not just that it's, you know, it's quite difficult to do it. Jesus says you cannot do it. It's impossible. So who will you choose? Money or God? Whatever religious people say, whatever devout people say, 
their behavior will give their hearts away. And one very significant area that it will come out is in the way that we use money. You see, do we use money for God's glory and the good of other people? Or is it about lining the walls of my own existence and making me and my family just more and more comfortable? Are we using our resources wisely to help people to know Jesus and to meet their physical needs? Or are we just always feathering our own nest? There's a friend uh, who joined me on some of the preaching training that I do in Asia, and he, we visited one, uh, one Southeast Asian city. And he said to me, he said, there is just so much stuff. People have so much stuff. And they just accumulate more and more. Every time they want to upgrade their phone, yes, they'll do it, just in case you thought we're off the hook. And the thing is, we're no different, are we? We just accumulate more and more and more stuff. And it's hard to live when we're surrounded by such a materialistic outlook on life where we have adverts pumped at us all the time, which suck the life out of us like dementors in Harry Potter. Jesus warns us how fake religion is very dangerous because loving money is spiritual adultery. And fake religion will receive a terrible reward. He's made that so clear with the story about Mr. Richmond and his selfish use of money in this life, which spelled disaster for him in the next life. And then fake religion's problem is this, that it just persistently refuses to listen to God's word. Well, may God give us grace to listen to his word and to respond to it and not just show him the hand. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, thank you that you are so patient with us. Thank you that you know what's going on in our hearts even now after we've heard this reading and heard your voice speaking to us again. Please, we, we humbly ask, change our hearts. Where we are blind, where we're deaf, change us. Where we can just hear a tiny bit or see a tiny bit of what you're saying and showing us, please have mercy and enable us to grasp it more fully and then to respond in the right way. Thank you that you are merciful and thank you that you are for us and that you are warning us because of your great love for us. Please help us to grasp that even this evening and respond in the right way to you now before it is too late. And we humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Neil. We're going to respond to what we've just heard by singing in Christ alone. Only Jesus can save us. We cannot keep God's law, but Jesus does. Let's stand and sing about Jesus now.
let's remain standing and pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope that is found in Jesus. Thank you that our every sin was laid on him. Please help us to follow him alone. Please help us to listen to his word. And please help us to not ignore his warnings. For we ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. And as we remain standing, we're going to declare together what we believe using some some words taken from the book of Titus, chapters 2 and 3, which are on the screen. As we say them, let's both reflect on the truth that we're declaring and encourage one another as we say them together. So let us declare our faith in God's salvation. We trust in God the Father, who has revealed his love and kindness to us, and in his mercy saved us, not for any good deed of our own, but because he is merciful. We trust in Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us, to free us from our sin and set us apart for himself, a people eager to do good while we wait for his glorious appearing. We trust in the Holy Spirit, whom God poured out on us generously through Christ our Saviour, so that justified by grace, we might become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Amen. Please do take a seat. Hazel is going to come up and lead us in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you with thanks and gratitude. You are love, and because of Jesus' sacrifice, we know what love is. We praise you that you are the same yesterday and today and forever, and that you are our solid rock, our fortress, our rescuer, our shield, our salvation strength, and our place of safety. We praise you, Lord, for being the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. You do not faint or grow weary. Your understanding is unsearchable. Your ways are higher than our ways, and your thoughts higher than our thoughts. We praise you, God. Your way is perfect. We praise you that your word proves true. We praise you, God, for your holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Help us, Lord, not to live as the Pharisees who love money more than you. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, not holding onto our possessions. Help us to live our lives ready for your return so we might be pleasing in your sight. Help us to live by your word and your guidance. Dear Lord, we pray for the ongoing war in Ukraine and those who have lost their homes, jobs, loved ones. Those who are making new homes here and trying to adjust to a different culture and new surroundings. Lord, please may they settle, find jobs and feel accepted by those around them. We pray for those hosting. Please bless them as they give up their time and open up their homes. We pray for all those asylum seekers and refugees who are seeking a safe life away from conflict, war and poverty. Please help us to welcome them and love them as you love them. We pray for the economy and the impending rises in fuel, gas, electric, food and mortgage rates. We pray for those in government to make wise decisions in how best to go forward with these issues. Please help us to keep our eyes fixed on you through all these difficult times, and for those with plenty to share with those who are struggling. Our mission focus this week is Joe Clifford, Wycliffe's media consultant involved in coordinating the use of media in scripture worldwide. 
Her aim is to make scripture accessible and usable by people in a language they understand. We give thanks for Jo, who is based in Germany. Thank you for her work to further your kingdom, dear Lord. Please bless her as she has been editing work done in Tanzania and recruiting new animators. May your Holy Spirit touch the people who read your word in their own language so they may understand who you are and seek you in their everyday lives. We pray that you would give wisdom and insight to Jo as she looks for new partners and ideas. We pray that many more people would want to be involved in the media work. We pray for her current accommodation as her lease expires soon. We pray you would give her guidance as to where you would want her to locate to, with the prospect of a move north to Bremen to share in a community with friends. If this is your will, Lord, we pray that a flat would become available soon. We pray for Jo's time here in the UK as she catches up with family and friends, that you would bless that and her time helping with St Mary's Holiday Club next week. Gracious Lord, we pray for the Holiday Club, which starts on Wednesday the 24th to Friday the 26th. We pray for the 90 children who have signed up, including many from outside St Mary's, that they would have fun learning about you, especially those from outside St Mary's. May you speak to them personally, and as they return to their parents, they may share the good news of you, Jesus. We give thanks for the team of volunteers. Bless them, Lord, and give them patience and energy. Be with the leaders, Kate, Nick, and Simon, who will be giving talks to the children. May it all go smoothly. Bless them all, Lord. We pray for the barbecue lunch on Friday at 12.30 that many parents will attend. We pray for good conversations and good weather. We now lift up all those in our church family who are struggling. Those who are fearful of the future. Those who are lonely. Those with depression and mental health issues. Those who are unwell. We lift the Wild family to you after James's heart attack last Monday. We pray, Lord, for healing and give thanks that James is now home recovering. Dear Lord, we pray that James may start looking to you during this difficult time. Please be with Tracy, Millie and Archie and comfort them all with only the comfort and assurance you can give. Thank you for their strong faith in you. May all these people, may they know your peace at this time and always. Jesus said in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Thank you, Lord, for your word of assurance and truth. We ask all these prayers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Hazel. We're almost at the end of our service together. Please do stay behind afterwards to get to know each, better, each other better. Drinks will be served at the back. But first, we're going to sing uh, two songs together. Our first song, reflecting on how Jesus is worth giving up everything for. And our second song, on how we deserve judgment, but Jesus has ransomed and redeemed us. Let's encourage one another and praise God as we sing together. Please do stand.
stand let's pray our heavenly father thank you for what we've heard tonight thank you for that stark reminder of the danger of false religion we pray that by your spirit you will keep us as faithful followers of jesus living for his glory and not for our own luxury we pray that our hearts would love jesus far more than money or any other fake religion Thank you that he is our, the way, the truth, and the life. We pray that you would give us confidence to trust him, to listen to his word, and to actively live for him until our lives end, whatever it takes, fixing our eyes on our future hope. For we ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Some final verses from the book of Romans. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Um, please do take a seat.